Sounds good. Hey, hey everybody. Uh, first of all, appreciate you joining. Happy Friday, and I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Had a good week. Uh, we are excited to have Urban Gateways here with us today. We've got a few uh, guest members from their street level team that are going to spend a little bit of time walking you through how do you take a good picture with your camera. And if you don't know the uh, the portrait uh, the portrait mode on your on your phone, you, you probably don't have a, a 12 year old in your house, but it is one of the coolest features I learned about. It makes uh, makes all your wrinkles go away. So we're going to teach you that kind of stuff and even more. Uh, the Urban Gateways team has partnered with Warner Co. and has uh, really helped us around the DEI and i um, focus and mindset and education. And uh, this is one great example of what they do. Street Level is a platform where uh, the, the youth of Chicago can come in and do anything from DJing, learning about music, um, doing art, um, you know, it'd be interview. Uh, there's just a wide range of things that they can learn through this platform. And I think more importantly, understand how to uh, connect with other people that uh, come to the same, you know, the same uh, uh, sessions that they do, build relationships and uh, turn a blind eye to, you know, racism and uh, uh, the differences and recognizing that there's more common in things like this than there are differences. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, to James and Ian, who are going to lead this session, and really excited about uh, what they have to share. James, Ian, all yours. All right, indeed. Happy Friday. Hope it's a happy Friday. Everyone's doing well, getting ready for the weekend. Uh, yeah, as Don mentioned, my name is James. I'm a media instructor here at Street Level. Um, I'll let my my co my name my name is yeah. Ian. Uh, I I started as an intern here and um, glad to help out with this uh, class that you all um, are here for. Indeed, indeed. So we're going to go ahead and um, get things moving, and we're going to start with a, a question that that I'll throw out to everybody, and um, me and Ian can can respond as well towards the end. But you know, we really want to you know hear from you all. Um, and our first question is, uh, what's your first memory? of interacting with the camera. Um, now, it can be, you know, video camera, you know, uh, disposable camera, or your phone, because that counts as well. Um, a lot of phones are actually at the standard or even better than, than some cameras now. Um, so if you want to talk about, you know, your first time taking pictures with your phone, um, what that experience was like, um, if you remember what you captured, uh, you know, we're going to take a moment to kind of share some of those out. So I'm going to give people, uh, you know, a little bit to, to think about it and, uh, you know, go ahead and drop those responses in the chat. And, uh, you know, as we see those, Don can read those off and we can kind of, uh, you know, just respond from there. So you guys should put that in the chat. Uh, sorry, the live event Q&A. There's a chat live event Q&A. Uh, I'll, I'll bounce back and forth on both, but Go ahead and throw it in live event Q and A, and I'll read those off. You like what? What the experience you remember having, or the most memorable one, even? Right. So me, the. The tricky thing about me is like I didn't grow up in a household where you know we had a lot of cameras or we took a lot of pictures. Um, and as a young person, whenever I would come across someone, like I had this neighbor who was an older guy, um, you know, and he, he just had a lot of things and photography was like his thing. Um, but, you know, as a kid, when you see someone, you're like, hey, you know, could I use your camera? He was very protective of it. Um, and understanding so, it was a it was a different time. This was like, you know, mid 90s. So cameras weren't accessible and they weren't as, as cheap. Um, so, you know, early on, I really didn't get a chance to get a whole lot of experience with cameras. Um, but strange enough, my the first thing that I remember, my first experience was being at street level. Um, so just to let people know, I started coming to street level uh, as a teenager at the end of my high school years and, um, you know, kind of stumbled on to this place from a friend. And, um, you know, we would just come to street level after school and it was it was just like a hang. It was just like a place we can come and uh, just kind of meet up and, and do whatever. Um, so during my first week there, um, we just happened to come and we had we had no intentions of doing anything. It was just a regular day after school. And um, 
we ran into two other people that were working on the video. Um, so we're like, cool, you know what I'm saying? We go over and check out what they're doing. And uh, they were making a video about um, just how young people are misunderstood by you know, teachers, parents, and all that thing. Um, so, you know, they were they were interviewing each other and they're like, yeah, you know, we want you all to, to go ahead and get involved and, and do some interviews about this topic. So, you know, um, they interviewed us and then, you know, they were like, okay, you can interview us. And uh, like I said, it was my first week at Street Level. I had had no experience with cameras and uh, it was just kind of a shift because like I said, I grew up once I, you know, whenever I encountered someone that had a camera and I wanted to use it, they would be protected. To now being at street level and you know this person didn't even really know me that well and they're just like here you know this is how you use the camera this is how you do this and uh that really became a, a turning point to me because it, it just really opened my whole world up into to all these other things um so that's probably yeah that's that's my first vivid memory of using the camera how about yourself um for me i remember uh I used to spend the weekends with my dad and we would go around like Hyde Park, Museum of Science and Industry and all that. And we would take pictures. Uh, I'd be at the playground and uh, this was the er uh, early 2000s, late 90s. And we had a uh, one of those film cameras, uh, not like the disposable or you got to take the film into Walgreens get processed, but you take the picture and then the picture comes out and you got to shake it out and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And Back then, I just felt like that picture was so powerful. And then I got older and you know learned a better vocabulary and read more. And I realized, you know, there's the cliche, you know, the statement that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I just look back at those pictures and I'm like, man, I spent those days um, having fun. That was my childhood. And if I go to somebody, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna talk to you about this. I don't have time to speak a thousand words or write a thousand words. Yeah. And that the picture there with the the lighting the focus the color all stuff that we'll be talking about later that captures everything in the moment and so that that was my first experience uh, with cameras later on um, I started taking these like little disposable cameras and eventually small little digital cameras on uh, vacations mm -hmm. love taking pictures of the beaches and uh, animals I've never seen before from like different states nice. so that's my experience uh, by the time I got to street level I had a similar experience to you where I came in. It's like, we're doing interviews today. That got more it's like the video work. But uh, by the time I got to street level, I had um, already bought my first real like DSLR camera. And I was super proud of that because I, I bought that with, I think, not, if not my first, my second real paycheck. Nice. So yeah, that's those are our experiences. Yeah. Hey, I, uh, I, I'll read a couple of these. And then I, I have one that I want to tie back to. Uh, so, so one post was, remember those disposable ones you drop at the supermarket and pray that what came back was good and appropriate, which I thought was good. Usually wedding ones are the ones that are not appropriate. Um, but I will say this, I do remember them. And um, the one thing that always seems to happen in my house is we always buy the ones where you go underwater that have like the plastic on them. And then we forget about them for about 15 years and find them like somewhere in a box. And then we try and go and, and that's kind of like a cool thing because then you realize, what vacation they were from. So that's that's uh, that's my little story there. I've got a uh, Steve has a bird in a tree using a disposable camera was his first experience. Um, and Stacy was first time with a real camera was borrowed from my, a friend for my honeymoon. I was intimidated, but the pictures came out amazing. And Sherry, I got an Instamatic for my 12th birthday film and flash cubes. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I agree that sometimes like when you get that first camera, it can be intimidating, especially like James was saying, like uh, with his neighbor, some cameras can get pretty expensive and people be really protective of it. They might have like knobs and dials um, that you might not know what to do with. But with what we're going to be talking about today, your phone can handle everything like your phone. You just pull out your pocket. I know um, uh, some iPhones and some Androids, you just double click on a button and the cameras up and you can take a shot within three seconds. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be covering like the real, real simple stuff. Nothing, um, nothing too intimidating. We hope. Yeah. So cool. Um, so yeah, you, know, you said something interesting earlier in talking about your experience with uh, working with cameras is capturing the moment, and um, that's really a big part of what photojournalism is. 
I mean, that's a part of what our everyday life is, is, is about. Um, I'm a father of two beautiful kids, and um, a large chunk of the photos in my phone are, are, are them. Um, my wife is in there too, somewhere, but it's, <laughs> my kids though, my kids take up the bulk of, of the photos I take. And it's all about, um, you know, capturing these different stages in their life um, and, and just, you know, not really taking the moment for granted. Of course, you have to, you know, live in the moment and, and put your phone down and interact and all that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's mainly, photojournalism is mainly about telling a story using photos and, um, you know, a large part of that lends itself to a person being at the right place at the right time. Um, so we want to shift into uh, the story of Emmett Till and how photojournalism uh, became a spark in the civil rights movement. Um, so first off, this is Emmett Till. Is anyone familiar with, with the name Emmett Till, the, the story behind it? Um, if so, we'll, we'll leave a little space for people to, to drop things in the chat. Can you give us like a just quick summary? I saw a few head nods in the- All Right, yeah. So Emmett Till uh, was a young man from Chicago. He was 14 years old and uh, he went to visit some family in Mississippi. And, um, you know, he was down there, happened to be at a store and uh, a white woman accused him of whistling at her, right? Um, so years later, you know, she, she recanted the whole thing and said it wasn't true, but, you know, at the time she made that statement. And uh, later that night, Emmett Till was taken from his home and brutally beaten and lynched um, and, and just sort of left for dead. Um, so, you know, when they discovered him, his body was totally, you know, uh, you know it was, he was pretty much mutilated. And um, his mother, uh, Maddie, Maddie Till, uh, made the bold uh, decision to have his funeral be open casket, right? And a lot of people had questions about this, like why would, you know, why would you want to, you know, have the last memory of your son be kind of shown like this? Um, but it was actually a, a statement that she insisted on. She wanted, um, you know, people to, to take notice of, of the ugliness of, of, uh, of racism at the time. Um, the fact that, you know, a 14 year old kid is, is not exempt from, um, you know, uh, this type of treatment. So she had the funeral, but there were also photographers there from different publications, uh, Jet Magazine, um, Chicago Defender, all these different publications. So, you know, at the time that was, that was the means of sharing information was through a lot of print and photography. So, you know, her main thing was, you know, she wanted everyone to see um, the result of, of racism. You know, um, and that, that spread like wildfire. Everybody, you know, um, got a chance to, to see those photos and it, it sparked outrage. It, it, uh, it uh, encouraged conversation um, and it really became a spark for people to, to kind of like take notice and, and protest against these things. Um, so, you know, it was a really pivotal moment in, in civil rights history and, uh, you know, the use of photography actually you know, help to, to progress that movement because now it wasn't these isolated incidents that people didn't know about. You know, this was in newspapers and magazines and things like that. So, um, and it was no longer just like word of mouth either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yep. like you open up the newspaper and you see something that may have happened on the other side of the country. All right. And that make that's what makes it real for the, the viewer. Indeed. Yeah. And, um, you know, now, you know, if we fast forward to, to today, um, you know, a lot of content is like way more accessible. You know, like we get these images and these videos um, at a rapid pace, you know, and, and sometimes it's, you know, I feel like it's important to take in, but I was just having a conversation with a friend the other day that, um, you know, it gets to a point where you have to actually like, kind of like control what you're taking in because it does have an effect. Um, so now in this in the slideshow, we come to these these two different pictures. Uh, I want to talk about the difference between these. Uh, on the left is the uh, you know the Emmett Till funeral, where we see a lot of uh, family members and, and you know people that attended there. Um, it's very somber mood. Uh, there looks to be some some police out, kind of you know keeping keeping control of the crowd. And on the right, we have a photo uh, from last year, last year's protest. 
um, dealing with the, the unjust murder of George Floyd. Um, so, you know, I just want to take a second to kind of look at some of the differences that we see here. Um, what about you, Annie? Do you, do you see any, what, what stands out to you between these two photos? Well, I mean, it's the, it's the change in era, but um, of, of course, you know, so we have the black and white footage versus the color footage, but I'm willing to bet that the picture on the right was mm -hmm. taken on a camera phone. Definitely. And Definitely. Uh, that, that's so crucial because you look at the picture to the left, who knows how many thousands of dollars of equipment that, that required a setup and then processing time. And of course, you know how um, dynamic the George Floyd protests were. You don't have time, you wouldn't have time to uh, set your stuff up and set, set up your equipment. Yeah. So I just wanted to make it like clear that it's like this photo on the right is not taken by some expert photographer who's like a professional who's not working for uh, Time Magazine or um, The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. This is one of the people. This is, you know, one of the people who probably was part of the protest. Yeah. And the, the fact that this is one of the people, they're able to kind of get closer to the action and really be amongst everything, um, you know, which is key. Um, Darnella Frazier was the young lady who, who filmed the murder of George Floyd. And, um, you know, now it's, with, with cell phones being so accessible, you know, whenever something happens, you know, it's almost instinctive, like people go to pull out their phones, mm -hmm. um, but it's a way of, um, it's kind of, it's used as a, as a tool of accountability. You know, if anything goes bad, you know, we have the footage here, like it's, it's, it's here, it's in 4K, you right. know what I'm saying? So um, you don't need to go down to the Walgreens to process. It. Exactly, exactly. And hope that it's, you know, the lighting is good. You can kind of tweak those things mm -hmm. as you go. Um, so this makes, you know, photojournalism just more, you know, um, I won't say more important, but it's like it's it's a necessity nowadays because, you know, so much so many things are happening. Um, it's more power, more responsibility. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, we, you know, 2020 was a, a, a really rough year. Uh, for a lot of people for various reasons. And, um, you know, while I know a lot of us, you know, kind of want to forget about it, I think it's, you know, it's it's going to be one of those moments that we look back at and, um, you know, really see that this was a, a turning point for better or for worse. Um, so again, with 2020, with everything happening with the pandemic and the protest, um, photojournalism played a huge part in just capturing that moment. And, um, you know, I think since we're still in it, it's just kind of like, oh, like it, it, it happened. It's a thing. But, you know, years from now, like my kids will be able to kind of like look at you know, what took place and, uh, you know, really get a, a, a better understanding of, of what happened um, you know, through pictures and, and video. Um, so with that being said, I want to show a, a video that actually talks about just how photojournalism played a part in capturing um, a lot of those moments from last year. When large swaths of our world shrunk down due to the pandemic, we experienced the world more than before by what we saw on our screens. And I think some of the most defining and lasting moments of this long year have been captured in photography and photojournalism. But when a photo has the power to define a moment, it becomes important to consider how images shape the way we live and remember history. Through examples in two major stories of the year, we can see how photographs both sharpen and limit our view of the world. Just to know, American news can be insular, and several stories here are based in the U.S., but there will also be images from other countries throughout. Many deem this viral image the symbol for 2020. It depicts Northern California wildfires surrounding a senior center sign encouraging coronavirus safety. To be clear, these fires on August 18th are not the ones caused by the gender reveal party in Southern California in early September. The picture is emblematic of the times in more ways than one. The climate crisis, the pandemic, the general feeling of the world on fire. The come join us amidst the flames adds a dark humorous touch. The photographer Noah Berger describes the charged atmosphere and the fast moving flames. As no stranger to shooting wildfires, he recalls the experience as definitely one of the top intensity fires that he has been in the middle of. This is what photojournalists do. 
go towards the event, though it may not always be literal wildfire, bear witness, and capture a moment for the public. But the role of the photojournalist goes beyond that, especially this year when many of them risked their own safety. They provided a window into the world when our own movement was restricted, sometimes to just our homes or neighborhoods. They showed us lines for food pantries from Minnesota to Texas. Families separated by glass in the first epicenter of the outbreak in the U.S., a nursing home near Seattle. The homeless, sleeping against an empty Las Vegas, makeshift hospitals, life in lockdown, and then how the world adjusted to this new reality. But some of the most harrowing photos came out of healthcare, and I think this is what photojournalism can do best put a face to the story. Even when everyone is masked and suited up, the photos show the humanity and emotion, like the fear and stress and compassion of the healthcare workers, but also their intense focus and collaboration, as seen in this resuscitation of a patient in cardiac arrest. These hold all the visceral and tactile qualities of a scene that text or lines on a chart cannot capture. Of course, photojournalism is not just an image or a series of images in a vacuum, but by definition, how they report the news, oftentimes through an accompanying caption or an article providing vital context. These are actually part of a series by photographer Patrick Chanel, who previously worked as a doctor himself. And in the article, he discusses the 20 to 25 minute successful resuscitation, but the patient later died. His words fill in the gaps in the photo series, describing the war zone atmosphere and a sense of unreality for the staff. The patient was labored breathing, who required live interpretation and a rate of death unlike anything he has seen as a doctor. But when many of us swipe through headlines or photographs on social media, much of the context and nuance are flattened. Journalist Amos Seberg says while images have demonstrated power to trigger empathy, that power comes with a downside. By squeezing the world into two dimensions, they can hide its depth. Which brings us to protests. More on this specific photo in a moment, but it's important to recognize that with highly politicized events like protests, a photo without context can be, at best, confusing, and at worst, deceptive and destructive. Like this photo on Facebook with a caption claiming mayhem in Oregon, when the photo is actually from December 5th protests in Paris. Or this viral photo of police swinging his baton at an elderly Sikh farmer that prompted, according to BBC, Prime Minister Modi's party claiming falsely that the farmer was not hit. Photographs hold a lot of information, more than we can ever recall from memory. But even if an image isn't being used to propagate misinformation, a photo is not unvarnished reality, nor is it how the subjects experience the event as one silent moment lifted from the flow of time with stylized light and perfect framing. There's always a point of view, whether it's in the decisions of the photographer, the accompanying article, or the editor's choice of image. Editing ethics also vary from publication to publication and might include cropping or light and color adjustments. And photos by non-photojournalists are not beholden to such standards. Therefore, perhaps seeking objectivity from photojournalism is not the goal, but rather honesty. As photojournalist W. Eugene Smith said in 1948, the journalistic photographer can have no other than a personal approach, and it is impossible for him to be completely objective. Honest? Yes. Objective? No. So when we see a moment-defining photo, it can't hurt to ask what lies beyond the image. This was taken in Minneapolis on May 28th, just three days after George Floyd's death. The silhouette of a protester, as photographer Julio Cortez put it, could be any person of any age, race, or gender. It could be you or me. He captured the exact moment the inverted flag, a symbol of distress, is backlit against a burning liquor store. And like the wildfire image, this fire demands attention because we are in an emergency. It'll be photos like this that define the protests, top publications here in photos, end up in textbooks. And with good reason, it's an unforgettable image. And it's unfair to dismiss a photo as just an aesthetically striking picture. There's a reason protest photos resonate so deeply. They're an external expression of grief and rage against the injustice of yet another Black person killed by the police, as well as representing the large-scale shifts in public sentiment and the will of the people demanding change. But images alone cannot represent a movement. Here, figures and data in people's accounts are critical in understanding the scale of the ever-evolving story. 
such as crowd estimations from all the different countries, polls on changing public opinion on police reform, and essays and posts about systemic racism beyond policing. And while destruction and violence get big headlines and far too many people were injured, there are so many scenes from protests that didn't come across our feeds. In fact, protests continued all summer, but coverage tapered off. That is all to say, a complicated moment is larger than its most iconic photographs. Because when there is a momentous event, there will always be something unseen, like scenes from nursing homes that cannot be published because the patients are unable to consent, difficult conversations and minds changed, stories and communities overlooked by media outlets. And while the ones we do see can range from intimate portraits to sweeping aerials, no one photo or series can scale the magnitude of this moment. We're still in it, so we will only begin to grasp the contours of its significance years from now. So, um, yeah, it's always uh, kind of surreal to, to go back to all of the photos from, from the previous year. Um, yeah. Like, it really is a, a lot that took place. Um, so, it's just always, just always wild to, to look at. Um, so, yeah, I think um, something that was interesting that they spoke on is just the fact that, um, you know, photos, photos are powerful, but, you know, it's, it's kind of taking one still image and there's so much more other context behind it um you know i feel like that was that was an interesting piece to speak on so that just lets you know um you know telling stories with photos um you know it comes across as simple and it can be but there is a bit of an art and a complexity to it um there was this term that i learned in, in film school mise-en-scene um, which translates into what's what's in the scene um, you know, everything and, you know, if you apply that to photos, everything that's in this photo, how does it help to tell a story? Um, which is important because, you know, at the end of the day, that's all you have. It's not like you have a, a, a video where it's an arrangement of images and it's like, okay, this leads to this. Um, you know, it's kind of, a, you know, it's kind of up to the, the viewer to, to, to take away from the photo what it is that they see. And for everybody, it might be different, you know. Even adding something as simple as like a caption can completely change uh, the photo. As we saw, like, uh, how those pictures are being used to falsify news. Yeah. Uh, when you add, when you go as far as add a caption, you might be able to redirect the user's uh, beliefs or uh, attention. I'm so, I'm apologize. Uh, a little phone alarm in my pocket. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I'm getting at is that when you're talking about mise en scène and you're looking at what you're going to be putting in your photo, that is part of that responsibility for like directing your message. So uh, this person who took this photo wanted a picture with someone with their hand raised. They could have done this um, in front of the Arby's, like in the previous picture, they could have done this um, on a nice sunny beach. But what's, what's important is that every single part of the image, and that's the George Floyd uh, portrait in the background with his name written, the flowers and signs meant to act as tribute to pay respects to um, him after his passing. And uh, when you look at your image, you look at every single part, uh, even if you feel like you have one subject, the background and everything surrounding it is just as important. Yeah, yeah, so it definitely takes uh, some, some critical thinking skills and viewing skills. Um, you know, I, I know often, you know, we like to think of this photography as looking within that frame, you know, we'll see people do this. Um, but you have to pay attention to what's outside that frame as well, because, you know, some of those things can be used to, to help enhance whatever narrative, you know, behind that photo. Um, so that's where, you know, composition and all these things come into play, um, because that's, that's kind of all you have as a photographer is just like, you know, how you, how you arrange everything that's, that's in this frame. Um, you know, what, what do you decide, what do you decide to leave out? And you know what do you decide that's important to show. Um, so uh, a good example of that is a, a photo from Gordon Parks. Um, he had a series called a, Seg a segregation story, 
and um, Gordon Parks uh, pretty much, you know, went out to, uh, you know, different areas like Mobile, Alabama, um, just to capture just like what life was. Um, and for the people that don't know about Gordon Parks, I'll just kind of run through some tidbits. He's an artist, musician, painter, film director, photographer. Um, he's mainly known for his, his photojournalism between the year 1940 and 1970s. Um, He's credited as, you know, one of the one of the founders of the black exploitation genre in film. Um, so like movies like Shaft and all that. Um, he's the co-founder of, of Essence magazine. And uh, I, I dropped this quote in because uh, I feel like this this resonates a lot with, uh, with, with me. Um, he Gordon Parks talks about, you know, why he chose to, to use a camera. Um, so in this quote, he says, I picked up a camera because it was my choice of weapon against what I hated most about the universe, racism, intolerance, poverty. I could have easily picked up a knife or a gun like many of my childhood friends did, most of whom were murdered or put in prison. But I chose not to go that way. I felt I could somehow subdue these evils by doing something beautiful that people recognize me by and thus make a whole different life for myself, which has proved to be so. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's that's powerful, you know, um, that quote, um, because he, Gordon Parks often referred to uh, this camera as a war weapon, you know, um, which you don't, you don't really hear often, but you know, now, like I said, with the cell phones, uh, you know, being so accessible and, and things happening, it is used as a weapon, that is, as accountability uh, for people to have the seats of, of different things that are, that are taking place. Um, so with that being said, I want us to look at um, one of Wooden Park's photos from that segregation story series. And um, I just want us to take a minute to, to take things in and uh, talk about what it is that we notice. Uh, what, what's the first thing that you notice? Um, you know, if you're out there, you can go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll have Don read off some of those responses. Um, but we just want to take a minute just to look at everything, um, me and Ian to talk about, you know, what it is that we see in this photo and, uh, you know, we'll just kind of, you know, uh, listen to some of your responses as well. I know personally for me, the, the first thing that comes to mind when I see this is family and yeah. you see um, everybody's, the, everybody's the brown skin, the colorful clothes, like the blue dress. Uh, a colorful background, but then it's uh, really in stark contrast with the white only water fountain. Right. And that sticks out because it's harsh and crude when compared to everything around it. And even though that might not be the dead center subject of this photo, it makes its own statement to say, like, look how wrong this is fitting into this scene of a black family. Right. And just the fact that, you know, it's it's so um, it's just like common, like they don't they don't really look phased by it. You know, no one's you know, they're at a different water fountain. Um, they're not even really acknowledging it, that they're just having a conversation and going on about their day, um, which, you know, says something about the time that this photo was taken, which is in 1955. Um, that this was still pretty much like the standard, um, you know, all around America. Um, I so, wonder, like what's going through my when I looked at it, I just wonder how, you know, I, don't, I don't know if there's, you know, a mom and an aunt or the, and a dad, but I wonder how they explain this to their children. Like, did they just make it not a big deal? Did they make it a big deal? It's just that conversation at some point had to happen. I just wonder what it was, because in my mind. That's true, you know, like, you know, they could have had the conversation beforehand or maybe, you know, after this this moment, you know, they discussed it, um, you know, but that is a that becomes part of the story, you know, it's just like what what is their reaction to it, if any. Um, so. Is there anybody in the uh, Q&A that might have any uh, comments or questions about this photo? So I have one post. It says, uh, I guess what they're what they're seeing. I just lost it. Hold on. Yeah, I got it back. Um, it's just life, the way things are. I mean, I think it's in line with what you just said. It just seems like they're going about their business, right? And, yeah. 
Right, like this picture isn't like the ones we previously looked at um, with Emmett Till's funeral and the George Floyd protest, where those were really crucial moments that were really heated and emotional. This was, this is uh, racism and just every day. This is probably just a random Tuesday in the summer. There was, uh, there, there's no real political statement being made. Uh, when they put those water fountains down to them, that was just a normal thing. Uh, which goes to show that you don't need to wait for something um, huge to happen and start taking your shots. Just photos, everyday things can be just as powerful. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yep. Um, so cool. Um, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of information we just get from this image. Um, like we know that it's, we know that it's warm out um, because of the way that they're dressed. We can see the sun. Um, you know, there's all these ice cream signs in the background. That's crazy that ice cream sandwich was 10 cent back then. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> you know, but um, all of this kind of adds to the story, you know. Um, so with that being said, I, I do want to transition into um, just more information about Gordon Parks, because I feel throughout this, it's important to just like share some of the photographers who are doing this work and that are like, kind of, you know, uh, monumental to, to this whole movement. Um, so I want to show this, this short clip, uh, you know, talking about Gordon Barks' work, and then we'll jump more into some composition of how you know these photos are, are taken. And finally tonight, the world through his lens. Jeffrey Brown has a look at the extraordinary journey of photographer Gordon Parks. Two children with a doll. Who are they? And what are their lives like? A young man walking away from us. Where is he coming from? And where is he going? Armed with his camera, Gordon Parks told stories of individuals and through them of the larger world. He had a, you know, fantastic ability to compose a series of elements within a picture to, you know, convey a sense of, of a story. Philip Brookman is curator of Gordon Parks, The New Tide, an exhibition at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Spanning the first 10 years of his career, from 1940 to 1950, it's a chance to see how a young man, self-taught and without a high school diploma, became one of the 20th century's master artists. Parks came to an understanding really before he ever picked up a camera that it could be a tool for him to use to be able to express his own feelings about his life. Gordon Parks was born in Fort Scott, Kansas in 1912, the youngest of 15 children. He credited his mother, Sarah, who died when he was 16, with giving him confidence and strength, even growing up amid poverty and prejudice. Park spoke of his childhood in a 1997 NewsHour interview. A disadvantage sometimes pushes you, you know, if you use it right, because you want to uh, uh, rid yourself of, of, of those things that hurt you emotionally when you're coming up. Inspired by the work of Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, and other Depression-era photographers he saw in magazines, Parks first picked up a camera at the age of 25. In St. Paul and then Chicago, he took portraits, including Marva Trotter Lewis, a performer, model, and wife of boxer Joe Lewis. He befriended and photographed leading African-American artists and scholars, including Langston Hughes, Charles White, and Lane Locke. And he did his first journalism, covering Eleanor Roosevelt's visit to a Southside community center. Parks called the camera his choice of weapons. Gordon Parks always had a sense that um, that media, that uh, the camera and photography and writing and, and media could be a very important tool in helping the world to understand the image of African-American people. And it was through that understanding that you could make the world a better place. In 1942, Parks was awarded a prestigious fellowship, allowing him to work as a photographer for the Farm Security Administration. His first assignment, documenting African-American life in Washington, D.C., then a deeply segregated city. Among his early works, this photo of a young boy who lost his leg in a streetcar accident. I was really struck by you know, how uh, intense the relationships are in the picture. The relationships so, between 
the relationships between the photographer and the boy, but also the relationship between the boy and the two girls sitting across the street. Yeah. These are things that Parks put them there for us to find. Yeah. And he knew he was doing that. It was here Parks created one of his most famous photos, a portrait of Ella Watson, a cleaning lady in a government building. I'd first ask her about her life, what it was like, and it was so disastrous that I just felt that I must photograph this woman and in a way that would make me uh, feel, or make the public feel about Washington, what Washington, D.C. was in 1942. The now iconic image called American Gothic after the fame painting by Grant Wood was part of a larger series on Watson, her family, and community. An extended photo essay style that Parks would go on to use throughout his career. Parks often, he would meet people and he would talk to them. He would learn their stories. He would understand who they were, you know, long before he would ever bring along a camera. He was able to use his own experiences and his own struggles to understand and empathize with others. In 1944, Standard Oil hired Parks as a photographer. He would continue to hone his craft and earn his first real paycheck traveling around the country, shooting scenes and portraits like this one of an oil worker at the Panola grease plant in Pittsburgh. What he's done is he's created a portrait of a heroic African-American worker mm -hmm. uh, working for Standard Oil. You know, this is an amazingly, you know, technical photograph to produce. And, you know, in a very short time, Parks has learned, you know, the skills, mastered those skills. He photographed white fishermen and farmers black pilots training for war, and he continued to break barriers. In 1949, he was hired as the first black staff photographer at Life magazine, where his photo essays included one on a Harlem gang member named Red Jackson. He also traveled internationally, shooting high fashion spreads in Paris, and celebrities like Ingrid Bergman in Italy. In 1950, he returned to his childhood home in Fort Scott to shoot a series for the magazine. And all of this was just the beginning. Parks would go on to write several memoirs and novels, to direct films including Shaft and an adaptation of his book, The Learning Tree, and to compose music while continuing to work as a photographer. He never understood that he wasn't supposed to do it. He just did it. Gordon Parks died in 2006 at the age of 93. The exhibition Gordon Parks The New Tide is on through February 18th. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. All right, so that was uh, Gordon Parks, uh, fantastic photographer if you get a chance you know check out his work and stuff is available um all over so um so with with gordon parks he inspired uh you know other people to sort of go into this field as well um one notable uh janelle shabazz who was born in brooklyn who uh is uh you know uh, he kind of gained his fame by taking street photos um in the, the late 70s early 80s um, you know, during that, that time where, you know, hip hop was kind of at its infancy and, uh, you know, that spilled over into fashion and a lot of different things. So, um, Jamel Shabazz was a, a pretty much a young, young teenager that was going out and taking pictures of his friends, you know, and capturing those moments. So, um, he's another a photographer to look into. Uh, I sort of transitioned to this because a lot of the works that we look at as far as, um, you know, breaking down composition of photos are going to be some of this work. Um, so with that being said, we're, we're going to move into just like how, you know, what's the proper framing for, for photos and like what are the purpose of, of all of these shots? Um, so all the composition basics. So uh, we're going to move to our first photo that we have. All right. So this is, uh, you know, it's referred to an establishing shot or a, a, you know, extreme long shot. And the purpose of this shot is really to, to sort of establish, you know, time and place of, of where, you know, where things are, right? Now, usually in, in movies and TV, you, you see the shot at the beginning of a, of a show or a movie, and that, that immediately sets up 
you know, where the story takes place. Without, you know, a narrator sort of giving you a voiceover, you can look at, uh, you know, a clip or an image and see uh, a landmark and know that, oh, this takes place in LA or Chicago. So, you know, if you see any of those, you know, I'm thinking of like a, like a lot of Spider-Man movies since Spider-Man takes place in New York. Um, you see like that long Brooklyn Bridge and, and that's kind of used as a way to, to, to really set up, you know, where, where things are taking place. And, you know, it, it gives the viewer a lot of information because this is the shot that's most zoomed out, right? You're catching all that you can, you know, with, with whatever your phone or your camera that you have. Um, so it's really meant to give the, the most information. Um, you can pick up a number of things, uh, the season, right? Like it's not snowing, the water isn't frozen. So, you know, I can guess that this is probably like maybe fall or something like that. Um, so again, these are minor details, but these are all things that you can pick up just from this one, this one composition style. And uh, maybe we move to the next one, I believe. Um, yeah, here we have uh, another uh, long shot. It's not as extreme. And as you change uh, these shot types, they're called shot sizes. And the, really it's about how far are you away from your subject. In the opening one where we have the extreme long shot, you're so far away that you are encapsulating several subjects, which was that city. Here, we're closer up in this just a regular long shot, and we see this crowd. Now, this crowd of people plays the role of the buildings from the previous shot, but we relate a lot more to people than we do buildings. So here, we're starting to see some faces. Uh, we can see um, what they're wearing. So we can see, you know, like, you know, like their age range who they may be, what the time period is, and it becomes more personal. And then if we go to the next slide, this is uh, will also be considered a long shot, but this is a little bit closer. Uh, you can see that uh, th there are just as many people, or maybe fewer, but they're all um, being shown in this scene fairly equally. There is not one single subject, and Again, this kind of shot would also could also be used as an establishing shot. Yeah. Um, you see where you are, you see the restaurants, you see the stores, you see the people, and it gives you the sense of the environment. And we can move on to the next one. And then we're starting to get into more of the subject-based uh, shot sizes. And this um, is really a full shot, and not, not a long shot as, as it's written here. It's a full shot. It just shows that um, you have your subjects, it's three people, and a full shot allows you to see them from head to toe. And um, at this angle, or I mean at this size, you can see where they are, but you also can see who they are. And it isn't just about the surroundings anymore, this isn't just about the set settings. This is really about these three women. Yeah, pretty much, yes. Yeah. As soon as you see this picture, like, you know, coming from that wide shot where your your eyes are just all over the place, like as soon as you know you go to this one, you automatically your eyes focus on these three subjects, and um, yeah, you're just able to see a little bit of their surroundings and, and gather that oh, this this is a subway or something. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a closer shot, um, more so focused on the subject. And um, depending on what kind of cameras you may have, or like even what kind of phones. Uh, you can switch from a long shot to a, uh, well, we'll get to close-up shots just by walking forward, or um, if you'd like, you can go into your camera, you know, do a little swipe to do the digital zoom, yeah. and uh, that's how you switch between these shot sizes, and uh, you don't, don't need special equipment, uh, except maybe the, the shot of the city we first saw, right, it might yeah. need like a ladder or a drone to get that high. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> I don't know. I'm always a fan of uh, what's your take on zooming versus moving closer to a subject? I always prefer to move closer. Uh, yeah, moving closer is great if the person knows that you're taking a picture of them. That's true. But if you're doing street photography and you want somebody, you want a candid shot, you want to see them in living their lives, mm -hmm. then maybe use a zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's definitely a way to go. Um, yeah, consent in street photography is. is, is um, I have to preach that to some students uh, at Julian High School when, 
he did this course at. And um, yeah, definitely. So well, we can move on to the next shot. All right, so here's a mid shot. And uh, like the previous shot, we saw those three women. It was a full shot, you know, head to toe. Here, we're starting to uh, use the bottom of the frame to cut off um, these two gentlemen at about the center of their torso. And this mid shot focuses more on their uh, their bust, their yeah. frame, the, um, mm -hmm. their faces, the silhouettes, and their uh, facial expressions. And also, we see that um, the man on the right has his armor on the man on the left. So it starts to show um, to emphasize the relationship between the two of them, especially since his arm stretches so far across the screen. Yeah. If we had gone back to something like a full shot, like with the previous with the women. And then you zoomed out on these two guys. Mm -hmm. the, his arm stretching around the other guy really wouldn't take up that much of the frame, so it seemed less significant. When you get this kind of photo, you definitely get the sense of who they are. Uh, but at the same time, you're sacrificing what the background is. We see here the background uh, blurred out, and mm -hmm. um, it's really just some glass windows. All right. And this sort of goes back to, you know, making that choice based on, you know, what you want the context of the photo to be. Um, I think here, Jamel was focusing on the relationship between these two, these two gentlemen. It wasn't more so about, you know, their backdrop of where they were. Um, you know, maybe that was something that didn't really add to, you know, telling the story. Um, so, you know, those are the decisions that you have to make. Um, when using these shots is, you know, when is a good time for a mid shot versus a long shot or, or whatever. Um, so. All right, get the next uh, picture up. All right, so this here is a close up shot. Um, as you tell with, with the way these slides are set up, we're going to be getting closer and closer in our shot sizes. And in this image, uh, it's just this man's face and you may think, well, I don't see his background, so it's less information about his background. I don't see his body or his arms. I don't know what he's doing with his hands. Well, you sacrificed all that, but now you can see the true emotion in his face. You can see the beads of sweat. You can see uh, the look in his eyes, and it's the emotion that sends the message in this image. Yeah, and with this, uh, usually with like a close shot, if you're doing uh, sort of like portrait style, you know, um, headspace is important. So like the typical composition for a shot like this would be, um, you know, from the neck to the top of the head. Um, but this is a, a little more closer. Um, like Ian said, it's about capturing that emotion and, um, you know, really moving in closer. Just, just that one adjustment sort of changes the, the whole mood of the, the picture. Um, so again, there's a, there's a reason that the photographer chose to do something that was this close you know as opposed to doing like a mid shot of him in a gym or, or, or wherever he may be we don't even know where he is right here you know it's completely black in the background we just know how he's feeling yeah exactly exactly and i, I think you know thinking about you know what's again mise en scene what, what's the story you want to tell you know so well we can move to the next slide all right and here again we have another close shot this time focusing on someone's feet um and, you know, that's the thing. These shots can be used to kind of, you know, focus on whatever it is that you want to, to tell a story about. Um, traditionally, you know, we think of like head shots as like, oh, you know, that's a close shot. It has to be someone's face. But it could be on any particular detail that you find to be um, interesting. And um, before we move off from this picture, uh, I was just going to give some advice. Um, like I do a lot of street photography and do some portrait photography. Uh, I shoot a lot. That's why I shoot a lot of people. A good way to know like when you need to zoom in on something and like how far you should zoom is if you look at certain people, it's like their joints. Like if you're doing a headshot, don't go past the shoulders. If you want uh, to do a shot like this and um, take a picture of this man's shoes, you don't need to go past. Uh, you see, they don't even go up to the knees. Yeah. Because the more of the person's body that you include, the less of a um, close-up shot it is, the larger the size is. Could you imagine seeing this shot if it was a full shot, like the women in the subway? Yeah, you, you like, probably wouldn't even pay attention to the right. shoes. Right, I don't yeah. remember what shoes those women were wearing. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to um, know when you're doing these uh, so uh, shot sizes, how far do you really want to 
um, zoom in. Yeah, we can go back to that. that um, yeah. And here we have the extreme close up um, with something that's even more close. Now, this is this is like probably one of the harder shots to achieve. Um, I know, you know, cameras do have like digital zoom and things like that. But, you know, if you were using like a DSLR or film camera, this is more of like a macro lens, something that can get in really tight and, and capture the details. I mean, you can see the the dirt under the, the fingernails here, like it's it's so close. Uh, but again, the main focus is the ring. Yeah, which I've never seen a Lord of the Rings movie. Oh, I, I've seen a few of them. Uh, but like in a film setting, uh, which you talk, you include a lot more stuff like motion and audio, a shot like this is called an insert shot. Yeah. And um, not much motion happens. You can't really can't happen because if he even like flinches his fingers, the ring would be out of the scene. But this goes to show, like you talk about closer shot of the man's face. This is even more detailed, goes into the engravings. And this is a little bit, yeah, uh, like uh, James was saying, this is a little bit harder uh, because, you know, the person moves their fingers a little bit or if you, um, sometimes if you get too close with your camera, the camera's like, oh, well, I can't even focus Oops, on yeah. that because it needs to be at least two inches away. Mm -hmm. uh, so this isn't really a shot that you will be able to shoot casually, but it wouldn't take that much effort to um, to, to get it with a little bit of prep. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, if we were, if we saw this in the context of the movie, uh, the use of this shot, you know, which is kind of, you know, amplify the importance of this ring. Uh, the ring is important. Now, what does the ring do? Um, I think it's like, it's like a cursed ring. It's an ancient ring. Okay. You gotta destroy it. Ah, uh, well, right, right. So there was a there was a big emphasis. So that was you know pretty much the point of focus of where they want to go. So that's why it's this tight shot, this really extreme close shot on the ring. Again, if we zoom out, you know, and we see both of the characters, like you know, we see that they're holding something, but you know, we don't really get the significance of of the ring without having this extreme close up. Oh, so let's move to the next one. All right, again, uh, very hard to, to uh, you know, uh, get this shot again. This is more macro um, if you have the ability to, and I think phones do, you do have abil uh, abilities to attach lenses to your phones, but I doubt that anybody is gonna, you know, go to that lens to, to achieve the shot. Um, and this, this uh, uses the same techniques as the one with the ring that we just saw um but now like i was talking about before when you're looking at people this is a uh, one of these extreme close-ups on a person so you can see all the fine details and even though it's all zoomed up on the face you can't see the emotion so then you start to get into the more um, physical architecture of the human body yeah. all right we're going to move on to the next um concept uh we went over sizes and uh, we got closer and closer to our image but as James was saying before, you might see people, you know, line up their shot like this or like this. That's the frame. Anything outside that, uh, the viewer will not see. And so when you're aligning something in your frame, uh, it's not always like you're um, aiming at a target. It's not always going to be dead center. So uh, I forgot the name of the gentleman, the, the mathematician, but some super complex uh, idea for what for like the guidelines of what an image should have uh so, um I, i'm sorry I, I can't remember what it was a uh, fibonacci it was fibonacci okay. and it's oh, super complicated but when you come to photography um the rule of thirds takes his concept on how to frame and set up an image and breaks it down into uh this model here with that you see with this dog you have um the screen broken up into thirds, vertically and horizontally, and it gives you nine spaces. And now the nine spaces aren't as important as the uh, crossover points, the focus points between the lines drawn. So for the rule of thirds, if you wanna lead your viewer's eye to an image, these focal points, you see where the dog's head is, uh, then there's another focal point lower down where the dog's chest is, and the same two are on the left side those are where you would put your object or your subject. That's where the audience's eye is drawn to. Now, 
it's called the rule of thirds, but it's really a guideline. You see a lot of images that do not follow those rules. And when they break those rules, sometimes they're pretty memorable. It's like in a sport, there might be a proper form to do something, but then you get somebody who's throwing the ball behind their back or doing a kickflip or something. That's not the, the traditional form, but that's the memorable um, rule breaking that they decide to employ. And so we can move on to the next slide to see some photos that use uh, this uh, so-called rule of thirds. And we see that both of these stems, uh, these flowers, are on those vertical uh, third slides. Mm -hmm. And now um, it having, nothing has to be perfect. And we see that the flower on the left is blooming and it's wide open. Uh, sometimes when you have a subject and you're shooting, you don't have to just get the face or just get the uh, maybe the logo on their shirt to be one of those focal points. You have their whole body go from one focal point to another, and that just makes the image more powerful. That's how we're using about maybe three of the four focal points here yeah, in this yeah. image. Uh, and uh, we can go to the next slide. And we see here, I, I really like this picture. Uh, I saw it when we were prepping for this. We see here that the Prada advertisement in the background, the vertical line is right on that uh, yep. rule of thirds line. Mm -hmm. And the man who's sitting down, he is at the focal point. And the man who's walking towards him is not at a focal point at all. Yeah. And he's breaking that rule and it just makes you kind of notice him, him more. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. Um, also the, just the other interesting thing about this photo is just uh, the, the uh, the juxtaposition, you know, like telling a story um, with just having, you know, what's in front of you. Um, you have a homeless man here. Um, you have this other guy who, you know, we don't really know his story, but he's obviously he's stopping to acknowledge this person. Um, but you have this Prada sign right behind him. I don't know if it's a Prada store, but just like that juxtaposition between the two things that we see. Um, I think it's pretty interesting, um, and that's a, that's something that you can play off of um, if you take the time to look at your surroundings before you take your photos. Like, what are the things that are that are kind of opposites? I was at a wedding over the weekend, and uh, there was a sign out in the lobby that said "No, no eating or drinking in the lobby," and everybody in the lobby had a drink in their hand or was eating something. So, you know, if I would have framed that moment. I would, you know, try to get as many people in the picture as I can, but also have that sign be in the background just to kind of like show the difference of, uh, you know, these are the rules versus what people are doing. So, all right. So those are those are the compositional techniques that we have time to go over today. Um, I just want to emphasize again, even though you know it's called the rule of thirds, and we gave all the vernacular for long shot, full shot, and close up. You don't really need to worry about that. Um, it's nice to get comfortable with those ideas, but when you're out there and you're uh, taking a photo, you see something that you think would be a good shot. Sometimes it's best to take the shot as you see it, and don't worry. Like people won't look at your image of a uh, of a firework show and say, "Oh man, that that firework didn't blow up on your focal point." Um, so it's always good to get comfortable, and then when you get comfortable, you can start kind of mixing up your techniques and. You could make up your own technique and give it a name, and 10 years from now, we'll be teaching a different class using exactly. your terminology. But um, the majority of this is uh, of this class is to talk about photojournalism. Right. And it's so important on what you're shooting. It's your subject or the mise-en-scene, and so it's like the subject and what is in the scene with the subject. Mm -hmm. And that is what sticks with people. Nobody's going to look at... Um, a Van Gogh painting and go, oh, well, see, he painted this person at this angle or this blah, blah, blah. Right, right, yeah. So always feel comfortable. Don't feel like these um, um, are limitations to your art and to the world that you see. Definitely, yeah. It's just, like I said uh, earlier, it's more so about just knowing the purpose of these shots. And I can guess that, you know, if you all were to share photos from your phone, like you have all of these shots in your phone, like you have long shots, you have medium shots, you know, you have some some photos that follow the rules of the, uh, the thirds. 
Um, but again, like Ian mentioned, sometimes it's just about, you know, just taking the picture at that moment and, you know, who knows that the other side, once you take the photo and you look back at it, you're like, oh, okay, I actually followed the rule of thirds. But you really didn't, you know, set out to do it. You just yeah. wanted to get the picture. And some cameras, like on your phone, you hit a button and then those lines will pop up for you. Yep. But um, I believe they're taking the pictures for their competition project, uh, teamwork. Yes. Um, I think a really good shot that we went over um, earlier when we are talking about the uh, full shots was those women in the uh, subway. Yes. So that shows, yeah, thank you. So this shows, uh, I don't know if they're a team or not, but this is a good framework for multiple subjects. And it shows that they are together, they are in the same environment, nobody is, um, you know, too far apart, too distant. There's no rivalry mm -hmm. or going on, rivalry going on or anything. Right. Uh, this is the kind of shot that I I saw the list of shots that we had, and I looked at this and like this is teamwork. This is a team. Um, in film, we call this a, a three shot because there's three people in it. But you would never have to like limit yourself to uh, something like this. In fact, I'm looking at the space here. You could take a shot and maybe fit 15 people in there to yeah. show a full team, and uh, you can decide your sizes. You want to, and with that many people, you probably don't need to see their shoes and pants. You might want to get closer so you can see all 15 people's faces. Uh, and of course, you want to talk about like positive, positive expressions, and um, you want to work with the people that you are taking shots of. Like James was saying uh, before, you want them to like you want them to know that the picture is being taken. And um, do you have anything to say about like the teamwork? Um, no, I feel like that's, you know, that, that those were all uh, kind of like good pointers. Um, you know, as Ian mentioned, just like knowing, uh, you know, what you want the focal point to be. Uh, something that could that can kind of throw that off is the amount of headroom, the amount of space that you have above your subject's head. Um, now, sometimes it can be it can be key if you want to highlight something that's above their head that's worth, you know, again, it's, it's about if it advances the narrative behind the photo. Um, but if it's just like a blank space, uh, you know, sometimes that can take away from, you know, what the actual focal point is, especially if you're taking a picture of a large group. Right. Um, and like you all do uh, construction, right? Yeah. So maybe it's a hard hat or maybe in a cap with a logo on it. Uh, so maybe you don't want to cut that out. So yeah. that the headroom that James is talking about, that definitely would help. Hey guys, I, uh, I know you could probably talk about this for another two hours. We would probably love that too. We're, uh, mm -hmm. we're we're out of time. There's about a three minute delay too, so they're gonna they're gonna probably be off for a little bit longer. But maybe just to, uh, to give some closing comments, if you wouldn't mind. I, this was phenomenal. I, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but the way you set it up with the yeah, upfront and then getting into some of the recommendations, I thought was was perfect and a really good mix of those. Thank you for that. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just a couple of uh, closing comments for the group. All right, uh, James. Do you have any closing comments, or I can take um, it? No, nah, I, I feel like this was this was cool. Um, again, I'm glad you all took the time out to to kind of take this information in. Um, and yeah, from here, you know, it's 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 always about applying the knowledge. Um, again, even if it's to your everyday photos that you take, um, whether it's your dogs or, or kids or whatever, whatever it is that you love that you that you capture, um, you know, just yeah, yeah, just think about, you know, how locations and, and different things can, uh, you know, impact the image and help to tell a story. And um, I just want to close with, uh, I hope everyone continues on with photography after this class and after your uh, project with the uh, teamwork images. Uh, I found photography. I wasn't really in a position where somebody inspired me. I literally was just online. It's like, wow, look at these photos. And I went and bought my own camera. And so, Photography is a passion project for me and doing something like this is a privilege because I know that even if just one of you takes this message home with you, then there's another photographer out in the world. Yep. And um, so of course, stuff gets complicated with cameras and things and because it's technology, but never be afraid to take a shot. And I just hope that uh, that message sticks with you and that maybe in the future i'll see some of your work in a gallery or up on a billboard somewhere awesome. all right
Thanks, gentlemen. We really appreciate it, James Ian, taking the time with the group, and uh, this was definitely fulfilling. So thanks for, for that. Have a great, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining. All right, indeed, have a good one.